let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6, title of our study today, A Firm Foundation. Hebrews 6, A Firm Foundation. Every builder knows that every building needs a firm foundation. And of the many pictures we have of Christ's church, the body of Christ being one, Jesus tells us that we are a temple made without hands. That he is fashioning and forming us, each of us having our place, each of us having a purpose. And so this idea that we're built on the solid rock of our faith in Christ, that he is the foundation well, that's an absolute essential. You see, the architect, the planner, the builder, they all have one goal in mind, and that's to build something that will reflect exactly what they had planned and purposed. That's what Jesus is doing in us. It's his work for us on the cross, his work in us now as he transforms us, and his work through us as he reaches out to the world through us. Now, the Hebrew believers addressed originally in this book would have mastered what our author calls the elementary principles of Christ. They are the absolute essentials. So that's what we're going to be looking at first of all, first few verses. Then we're going to wade into some pretty deep waters, try to make some difficult things simple and clear and then we'll end up with some great illustrations from our writer that should uh, lead to some real encouragement for each of us. Well, leaving the discussion, he begins with the word, chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection from the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Let's start with the stated goal, our perfection. Now, if you're young in your study of Scripture, a new believer in Christ, the idea that God calls you to be perfect is probably a little disturbing because, well, you have to be aware you're a little bit south of perfection. And uh, the reality is that's true for all of us. When he talks about perfection, Jesus is the only model we have for that. No one else was tempted in all ways yet without sin. So when he talks about us being perfect, he's talking about us being fully mature, fit for the work that he's called us to, representing him to one another, representing him in our homes, in the workplace, representing him at play, representing him wherever we are and whatever we're doing. Fully mature, fit for every work of ministry. We know, of course, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved for good works that he's planned and purpose. So a lot of this is just discovering what he has in mind as we mature in him. Now, he calls these elementary principles of Christ. The things we're looking at, there are only six, and actually repentance from dead works and faith toward God are more one thing than two things. They're required together, but in any case, he calls them the foundation the elementary principles. If you're new to Christ, it's important to know that you don't grow yourself. In the same way, and we saw this in our last study, we look at a baby, the baby is fed, the baby's nurtured, the baby's changed, the baby's cared for, and the baby can't do anything for itself. And yet, miraculously, it looks natural and yet supernatural. The baby grows into a child and the child into an adolescent, the adolescent into a teenager, the teenager hopefully into an adult. And all of that, it just sort of happens. What's our part in it? Well, we need to eat, we need to exercise, we need to rest. But all of that doesn't, it doesn't make the miracle of growth happen. It just aids in what God has already 
put together as he fashioned and formed us in the womb and planned and purposed our life out of the womb. When he mentions the foundation, the elementary principles, he's talking about the ABCs or the one, two, threes or the do, re, mis if you're musical. He's talking about the first things, and it's essential that we have the first things. If you're a new Christian, you have to be sure of these things. If you're a more mature Christian, you should be sure of these things. If you've grown up in the church and never paid attention as a young person, you just kind of went, it was social, you gave your life to the Lord, you know you're born again. There are a lot of people like that, just never really studied the deep things of God or even got rooted in the foundational things. We're going to look at some of both today. Well, he starts with repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. This, by the way, is our response to the good news of the gospel. Jesus said, upon this truth, I will build my church. Upon this declaration, when Peter confessed that he was the Christ, the word means Messiah, Savior, anointed one, the son of the living God, he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. So it starts with the gospel. If you're new to all this, someone invited you or you wandered in, you saw the marquee and thought, well, I never saw that movie. And now you realize, oh my gosh, there's not going to be a movie. And it's a little awkward if you're in the middle to get out. People are going to notice if that's you. Well, here's the thing, it's, you hear the gospel message that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, that there's forgiveness and life eternal in him. It starts there for all of us. It's a foundational principle of life in Christ and life for Christ. So repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. Repentance, if you're unaware, means more than regret. It means more than remorse. It means more than confessing that we've sinned, that we failed to do what we should, and we've, well, we've done things we shouldn't have. Repentance is more. It is a turning from our old way of living and thinking, our lifestyle of selfishness and sin, to just turning our life over to him, letting him have us completely, transform us, completely and that's where it begins i turn from thinking i'm okay remember those bumper stickers i'm okay you're okay i think a bumper sticker that said i'm okay i'm worried about you would be more you know (laughs) legit i'm okay because i'm in him and if you're in him you're okay too and he's going to make that very clear as we press on well here's the deal regret remorse confession judas had all that He regretted what he'd done. He said so. There was remorse. He came back and tried to return the money he sold our Lord out for. And he said, I've betrayed innocent blood. That's a serious confession. But we read of Judas, he found no place for repentance. Though he regretted, though there was remorse, though there was confession, Judas never really repented. He is a real example to us of the danger of thinking because I hang with God's people, because I read God's word, because I sing these songs about or to God. I must be the real thing. We'll talk more about it. But all of this to say, Judas, well, he hung himself. He took his life because he never came to repentance. It brings me to another issue, and that is, well, And every time I bring this up, somehow someone misunderstands and thinks I'm saying something negative about these organizations. You know them, AA and NA. I want to be very clear. Pay close attention. So if somebody says, did you hear what he said? Yeah, he said something good. Uh, NA, AA, all for them. They are wonderful ministries. They're getting people sober. They're getting people off drugs that are destroying their lives and destroying their health and destroying their families and a danger to the community. They're great organizations. And they too require that there would be confession. 
that there's someone greater or something greater, God as you define him or know him, that there would be restitution for the things you've done. And all of that's good, but here's where it ends. All of that can never bring life. Life is a gift from God, everlasting life, bought with the precious blood of Jesus, purchased. He bought us. We're not our own, we read. We've been bought with a price. So it's essential. It's important that we realize today that, that while, you know, church is a good thing, just going to church, well, some come because, well, my marriage is a mess and I want to straighten it out. We have help for you in that area. My finance is a mess. I need help. We have that. But if, if your marriage is better and your family relationship improves and your finances approve and you never give your life to the Lord Jesus, you still die in your sins and you still perish eternally, separated forever from him. He says we need to repent from dead works. That can mean at least these two things, works that lead to death. This is simple. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God, everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. I have to repent from and of my sin, my transgression, my rebellion, my willfulness, my foolishness. Repent means to change my mind about it, to change my heart toward it, and to change my lifestyle as a result of those changes. So a lifestyle of sin leads to everlasting condemnation, as we'll see further in. Then there are those works offered by those dead in trespasses and sins. These could really be good works. You know, it's possible. And many of you could bear witness to this if we were taking testimonies. You could say, hey, before I was a Christian, I was a good person. I cared for the poor and I watched out for other people and I was kind and I was patient and, and I did my best to be loving and forgiving and merciful. All that can be reality, but it doesn't constitute salvation and life. Again, those are good works, but they're not acceptable and they don't make us acceptable to God. So, so we have to repent of those works that lead to death, and we have to repent of the idea that my good works could lead to life. They can't. Religious good works can never atone for sin. And that's fundamental. That's elementary. That's foundational. Paul says at one point, I have no confidence in my flesh, no confidence in the works of my flesh. It's faith in Jesus in his blood, in the cross, plus nothing. He moves from our relationship upward because that's the primary relationship. If you're working on this level, trying to improve things on your earthly plane, and you're not right with God, man, you've got to turn that around and get things right with him first. He moves to the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands. Now, remember, these are Hebrew Christians. They've been raised with religious traditions and not just a religion of man. These are the things ordained and given to them by God. And yet they had to come to an end of thinking, man, we're going to be okay because we have the temple or because we have the feast or because we offer the sacrifices. We celebrate the festivals. All of that was good, but it didn't bring salvation. And we'll see that very clearly. We get into chapters 9, 10, 11, and such. Well, doctrine of baptisms. If you have NIV, I think it says washings. And that's actually legit because the word is used of washings and baptisms. There's actually a place that says call on the name of the Lord and wash away your sins through baptism. So they would have saw this word related to first washings. And, and of course, we know because we have the whole story. We're washed judicially, cleansed judicially by the blood of Christ. We're cleansed practically by the word of God. It's why we're in it, reading it, refreshing ourselves in and through it. So they would have seen the ceremonial washings. This is an important issue. It helps you understand why when they came to Jesus saying, hey, how come your disciples are eating with unwashed hands? They weren't stressing or worrying about the fact that 
that it was poor hygiene. They were thinking there was something wrong spiritually because they were all about, hey, when I eat, I do this fancy washing and it's to the elbow and it's all the way up and everybody sees it and everybody notices it. And Jesus calls them hypocrites and says, hey, outside you're looking pretty good, but inside corrupt and defiled. And he makes it clear it's not what goes into a man that, that defiles him, but what comes out of a man. And, and all of that to say this. Jesus wasn't concerned with the externals. He was concerned with the internals. That's how God changes us, you see. Religion changes us from the outside in. You get it with a group of people that are spiritual. You ask them, okay, what do I need to do? What shouldn't I say? Where shouldn't I go? What shouldn't I watch? And it's mostly what you don't do. And then there's a little of the do-do, too, uh, what you do do. And uh, Paul actually uses that terminology, but in another way. But, uh, you know, he says, all these things are but dung to me. All the good he did, all that he prided himself in. Well, here's the thing. Ceremonial washings. Well, they also knew proselytes to Judaism would have identified through baptism. It was common. John's baptism wasn't the first. It was just unique because prior to John the Baptist, people baptized were being baptized to say, I want to follow after the true and living God. John comes on the scene and he's asking God's people to be baptized, to testify of their sin and their need for repentance, to stop trusting in their heritage or their works or their religious um, in encounters and to just trust in God, to put their faith in God alone. So the baptism of John, the baptism of repentance. Then we come to Christian baptism. This is baptism into Jesus. It makes us a part of the body of Christ. Of course, anything the Lord gives us that's straightforward and simple, somehow men find a way to confuse, and they argue about it and divide over it. We are all baptized into one body by the Spirit. That's Christian baptism. If you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, if you've been sealed with, because that's what happens. You give your life to the Lord. Um, Jesus comes. We pray, Jesus, come into my life or Jesus, come into my heart. But you do know he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So in the person of the Holy Spirit, third person in the Trinity, he enters in takes control, begins to teach, begins to transform, begins to make us holy. As all that's going down, that's the first step, you see. And anyone who's trusted in him, who's born again, has been baptized into the body of Christ. We're a part of the body of Christ universal. It goes back to the beginning of the church and it extends all the way till we all stand before him in heaven. And then there's water baptism. And by the way, while not essential for salvation, it is a command of Christ. We are to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're commanded to be baptized once you give your life to the Lord Jesus. And I know there's some confusion in this area because, well, some of you were baptized as a baby. Here's the simple question. And we always ask it at the baptisms. Did you repent of sin? Did you confess that you were in need of God's forgiveness when you were four months old or two months old or whatever happened to you? It's doubtful. And so baptism in water is an act of obedience. It's a public testimony to the faith you've put in Christ and to the life you have in Christ. It's a, a beautiful expression, as we're told, we're buried with him in baptism and raised in newness of life we're identifying with jesus in his death burial and resurrection it's figurative for us it was literal for him but we're identifying and then there is well another term often argued about the, the baptism of the holy spirit i think the terminology causes more problems than it needs to here's what we know the spirit comes alongside we give our life to the Lord, the Spirit enters in and takes control and begins to transform. Then we publicly profess that through water baptism, and then we pray that God would anoint and empower us for a life of holiness 
and a life of fruitfulness. And whatever people want to call that, we're all in need of it. All my Baptist brothers acknowledge it. They just disagree with my Pentecostal brothers about what we're going to call it. So let's just all acknowledge we need all three. We need to be sealed. We need to publicly testify to that reality. And then we need to be filled so we can live the life he's called us to. And by the way, this is all foundational. These are elementary principles. If you're new, it's all right that you don't know. If you're not new, you need to be sure of these things so we can do as he says, move on, grow up, press in to what God has for us. The laying on of hands, it was used as a sign, a symbol of acceptance into fellowship. Many of you know Paul, formerly known as Saul, converted on the Damascus road. He's blinded. He goes to a house in the city. And, and then, well, someone is sent to him who lays hands on him and says, Brother Saul, he's acknowledging you're forgiven. You're a part of the family. You're born again of the Spirit of God. And, and other great things begin to manifest, but, but it's a picture, and you see it again and again in Acts, where they laid hands on people to say, hey, you are a part of us. It was also used and is of ratification of God's ordination. We live in interesting times because you could actually go away to a Bible college and uh, you graduate from the Bible college and then they ordain you to ministry and they send you out and even give you a church. Now, the Calvary chapels have never done that. What they do is they train you up and then they say, good luck and, you know, we'll be praying for you. And, and you just kind of go out there. If there's no call, there's no fruit, there's, well, you won't be gone long. And, uh, you know, so, so here's the thing. I'm not knocking Bible college. I'm 100% for it. I'm not knocking the ratification of men called to the ministry. That's essential. But we need to understand that God is the only one who ordains us. It's his call. They're his gifts. It's his life. It's his plan lived out through us. And so God ordains and we ratify. That's the simple way to say it. We're acknowledging the call on a life, not because someone has an education, but because there's fruit in the ministry that we observe them in. I was fortunate enough to be a part of a, a, a school of ministry at Calvary Costa Mesa. It was the only formal Bible schooling I had, but it was a great group of guys. All of them felt called to ministry. It wasn't just a random group of people whose parents sent them to Christian school because they were afraid of what would happen at Chico State. It was... It was all of us knew there was a call on our life. And most of the men in that class, there were about 60 guys. Most of them went out and pioneered churches, some of them multiple churches. But the point is this. If there's a call on the life, it's God's call. If there's a plan for your life, he's the only one who knows it. So it's all about his ordination and then our ratification. Also, this is used in scripture for the impartation of gifts or blessings or healings and the one thing that we see is consistent they're always God's gifts they're always God's blessings they're always God's healings it's not that any man has any power apart from him it's his work it's his Holy Spirit it's his call it's him and so it's Jesus in salvation it's Jesus in transformation it will be Jesus in our glorification. So we have repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands, then of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now listen, the first looked up, the second look around, this looks forward. And it reminds us that, well, the Old Testament saints they believed in a general resurrection. Why? That's the light they were given. They understood there would be a resurrection in the last day. What they didn't know is that there would be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Listen to Jesus' words. The hour is coming and now is when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Some to the resurrection, 
those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. It's one of those verses that at first reading you're like, wow, I don't know. I've done some good and I've done some evil. I'm not sure where I fall into this. Listen, if you're not in Christ, there is nothing you can do that is acceptable to him. You have to put your faith in him and let him work in you and through you. If you are in Christ, your works are acceptable to him. And if your motives are wrong, he'll challenge and change those. If your attitude's wrong, well, he'll challenge and change that. But the works are his works. So the point is, when the resurrection happens, we having greater light, following the one who said, I'm the light of the world, he who follows after me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's the one we're following. He's the one we're following. We have greater light. We know there will be a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. Revelation 20 makes it clear those take place a thousand years apart. And he makes the point that you want to make sure blessed are those who are a part of that first resurrection. Why? There are no unbelievers at the first resurrection, and there are no believers at the second resurrection. At the first, our works are judged and rewarded. We've recently looked at that reality. At the second, the books are open, sins are judged, men are judged by their works, which is what men say. Oh, I just, oh, I think I could handle the man upstairs. I don't think you can. I don't think you want to stand before God and declare your righteousness because he says, in me, in you, in us is no righteousness except that which he imparts when we put our faith in him. Well, those who know the Lord, who've yielded to the Lord, who are living for the Lord, it's eternal bliss and joy, light, love, peace, every good thing with him for eternity. Those who don't, separated from him for eternity now he says verse 3 and we read it this we will do if God permits do what move on beyond these foundational fundamental elementary things and he immediately takes us into the deep water it's like you've got your water wings and you're you know you're kind of floating around and then he just takes them and sends you off the high dive and you're whoa this is deep and this is what we're gonna see Verses 4 through 8, though they've often been misunderstood and misapplied, though they've led many to confusion and fear and division, all of that's the work of the enemy, and it shouldn't surprise us at all. The one who would tempt Jesus saying, hey, I know what you're here for, and I can get it for you wholesale. You bow down to me, and all this will be yours. Listen, that's the same one, that liar who is a liar and a father of lies, we're told when he lies, he just speaks in his native language. That's what he does. And it should come as no surprise that he would take a passage meant to encourage us, to secure us, to give us peace. And he would use it to destroy or disturb or derail those who misunderstand it. Listen, as a pastor, and I've been doing this for a while now, I've noticed whenever we address difficult issues, there are basically two groups of people. We fall into one or the other. Now, there may be others, and for our purposes, let's just say there are the unruly and there are the faint-hearted. The unruly, that would be the person who's just like, I'm going to do my thing, and I'm saved, and, you know, I, I, oh, the blood will cover it and all that stuff, and, and he say it to the unruly, Warn them. Call them to repentance. That's not just my job. That's your job. It's not just my call. That belongs to all of us. Warn the unruly. On the other hand, comfort the faint-hearted. And I've noticed that all too often, it's the faint-hearted that hears the warning. And I'm like, and then they come up and they're like, oh, I don't know. I think I'm going to perish. Or I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. Listen, have you ever, well, don't raise your hand, but... Uh, <laughs> Have you ever committed adultery? Because there is no more heinous sin that you could commit against your spouse and against your kids that you could commit against another human being you've pledged to live for and live with and love on than to commit adultery. But David did that. 
And not only did he commit adultery, he murdered as a cover-up for the adultery. And get this, under the law, there was no forgiveness for murder. The law condemned the murderer. There was no way to get out of it. The only hope David had was the mercy of God. And he cast himself on the mercy of God. And he went from hiding from God to hiding in God. He confessed his sin and found forgiveness. So the reason I bring it up, some of us are faint-hearted because we've sinned and we know we've sinned and no one else knows what it is or what we've done or what we thought we were going to do and somehow we didn't do it, but the enemy's still beating up on us. And if that's you today, know that God wants you to be secure. He wants you to know that he hasn't written you off and he will never leave you or forsake you or lose you. That's not his plan. His plan is your maturing and your perfection when you stand before him in glory. If, on the other hand, you're unruly and you're just, hey, I don't care, and a Christian can live any way we want. Paul says no. In Romans, he, he says, how shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Shall I sin that grace may abound? God forbid. May it never be so. It is impossible, we read, verse 4, for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Some suggest this is a warning that a believer can lose his salvation after seeing and experiencing and knowing if we fall away, well, we're going to lose this gift of everlasting life. Now, track with me on this because it's as essential as the things we've already considered. If it's a free gift and if it's everlasting and if it's a gift of God and from God, we're not going to lose it. We're not going to forfeit it. He's not going to take it. He says we're in his hands and in the Father's hands and no one can snatch us out. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I could give you verse after verse after verse, but the point here is he's not saying you're going to forfeit God's gift of everlasting life. His purpose is to provide security to the immature or the insecure, to, to the one who thinks maybe I've gone too far. I mentioned Judas earlier. Some cite him as their example. Oh, you know, he had an experience. He was chosen by Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He was sent out, as were the others, two by two, to preach, to heal, to cast out demons. Judas participated. The Holy Spirit came upon him. But Judas never had the kind of experience we have where the Holy Spirit comes in and seals us, guaranteeing the purchased possession. How do we know? Well, we know, first of all, because Jesus said Judas was not a child of God, was not a son of God. He was the son of perdition. And when he died, he went to his own place. It's a crazy thing because... I think Judas is important to us. I think for those who are unruly, he's sort of the role model. Don't, don't convince yourself because you hang with the people of God because you sing songs about or to God, that you read the Bible, that, that that's the same thing as being saved. I did all that before I was saved. And I did it with other people that weren't saved either. And we all thought everything was good until we realized it wasn't. That conviction came from the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the point. Judas was with them, but he was not of them. Judas was with Jesus, but he was not of Jesus. He never surrendered his life fully to Jesus. And so he's the warning not to the insecure here, but to the unruly. Because he was never a child of God. Well... Here's the thing. I have never met anyone who preaches or teaches that a Christian can lose his salvation that doesn't believe that Christian can regain his salvation. But verses 4 and 6 say that's not the case at all. If it were possible, it would be impossible 
if they fell away to renew them to repentance. Do you see it? It is impossible for those who've had these experiences, will define them, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Here's the point. Here's his point. It's not that if you fall, you can't come back. It's that you're not going to fall away if you're in Christ Jesus. He will say, when we get further in, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. He said, I know this isn't you. I just want you to know that if that were possible, it would be impossible. Here's the thing. If you grew up in a religious tradition where on Friday night you went and sinned, And then on Sunday, you know, you lost your salvation Friday night. Sunday you came and you gave your life back to the Lord and you're saved again. Then Wednesday night, you couldn't wait to Friday, so you sin really bad. And uh, and then you come back on Sunday and you you give your life to the Lord and you regained your salvation. That, That is not the salvation we have in Christ. I'm saved when I'm doing good and I'm saved when I'm not doing good. I'm saved when I'm living it and when I'm not. I'm not saved because of what I've done. I'm saved because of what he's done. And the security I have is in him. That doesn't mean I'm free to sin. Of course not. That would be insane to want to go back to the life he rescued me from, redeemed me from, so that I could have the life he intended. Well, the whole point is this. There is no way, if it were possible, for you to be lost to him, for you to be found by him or regained by him. That's exactly what 4 through 6 is saying. So what do these words actually mean? Enlightened means enlightened once for all. I already mentioned it. We're following the light of the world who said, if you follow after me, you will not walk in darkness. We were in darkness. We were deceived. We didn't see him, but now we see Jesus tasted the heavenly gift and tasted the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. Listen, there are those who again will say, well, this is that, you know, like Judas, maybe you just sampled a little. This word for tasted goes well beyond that. It was used back in chapter 2, verse 9. Let me read it to you. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Oh, Jesus didn't just sample death. He died for our sins fully and finally. When he cried from the cross, it is finished, paid in full. He meant just that. He died, he was buried, he rose again. And you know all that. Well, He also calls us partakers of the Holy Spirit. We are partakers of his gift of life. We are partakers of his righteousness. We are partakers of his son and partakers of his grace. All of those are used in Hebrews to describe our our permanent and current relationship to the Lord. Well, verses 7 and 8, a simple illustration. No doubt the author realizes The enemy will try to confuse this. Some people will read it wrong. And so he gives us a very simple illustration. It's sort of based on Jesus' teaching in Matthew 13 that, you know, the seed goes out, it takes root. If it takes root, it produces fruit. Well, read it with me. The earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Now, Jesus says at one point, a good tree can't bear bad fruit. A bad tree can't bear good fruit. Why? The fruit is determined by the actual root. You know this agricultural area. You plant almonds, you get almonds. You plant oranges, you get oranges. You plant apples, you get apples. Why? Because everything God made, he made to reproduce after its own kind. It's important because we know once we're in Christ Jesus and he made this simple, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches apart from me, you can do nothing. There will be no fruit unless we're in Christ and unless Christ is in us. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit, by the way. 
The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and faithfulness and goodness and self-control. Listen, here's why this is so important. He's saying we can examine our own lives. We don't need to examine one another. We just do a little self-examination. Am I a person who actually loves? Because I can tell you, I thought I knew what love was before I came to Christ. I found out I didn't know at all what love was. I would have never thought of loving my enemies, nor would have had any idea that that was possible. And then even loving my wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, man, that was well beyond me in the natural. And even as a spiritual man, I have to rely on the work of the Spirit to keep me straight in these issues. It's love and joy and peace that, that we can't manufacture, that the cults can't reproduce, that, that it, it's him, you see, working in us, transforming us. And so in that parable of the sower, he says, you know, the seed is sown, the condition of the heart is the determining factor, but even among the hearts that are right, we don't all bear the same amount of fruit. Some bear 100, some 60, some 30. That's his teaching. But we all bear the same kind of fruit. We all bear the same type of fruit because it's the fruit of the Spirit, you see. And as I bear the fruit of the Spirit, I've learned that's where the seed is for reproductive fruit. As I become loving, as I become merciful, as I become kind, as I become patient, well, that's the seed that enables me to plant the gospel in the hearts of others. They're attracted to what they see is so different from what they see everywhere else, especially when we do what we're told to do. They make themselves an enemy, we love them anyway. They falsely accuse, we care for them in spite of it. When we do that, that opens doors. And, and so all of that to say this, we're not all going to bear the same amount of fruit, but we all have the same kind of fruit. And he says that of them. For any insecure or unsure, note this beautiful contrast. Beloved, we are confident, verse 9, of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name and that you've ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now listen, he says, we're looking forward to the things that accompany salvation. Those things are the life of fruitfulness, that he's planned and purposed for each of us. And he mentions their work and their labor of love, motivated by love, ministered in love, a demonstration of God's unconditional love. He says, you've shown it, and you show it in your day-to-day -day ministry to the saints, those things you're doing. And we want you to have full assurance, the full assurance of hope, not to be sluggish, to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now this looks back, and we saw it some weeks ago, at Joshua, at Caleb, at the children of Israel, not the generation that perished of unbelief in the wilderness, but the generation that inherited their inheritance. He's saying, we want you to have that experience, to inherit all God's plan and all God's purposed for you. So he concludes, and we will as well, with three absolute reasons for confidence that he who began this good work will be faithful to complete it. When God made a promise, that's our first word, promise. God made a promise to Abraham. I think Jacob just walked us through this in my absence. Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you. So after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Here's the interesting thing. There are actually a few, but I'll just stick to two. God swore by himself because there was no one greater to swear by. In the same way that we've seen 
The prophet said, thus says the Lord. Jesus doesn't come saying, thus says the Lord, because he is the Lord. He says, I say unto you. The father can't say, well, I swear by, he's just like, I swear by me, because there's no one greater. But there's something else. After he patiently endured, if you're familiar with the story in its early state there in the book of Genesis, I don't see Abraham and Sarah as being completely patient. Oh, for a week or a month or a year maybe. But over time they grew impatient and they tried to help God out. That caused some serious problems. But we'll look at them again when we get into Hebrews 11. We'll spend some weeks looking at those heroes of faith. We'll talk in detail about Abraham and Sarah, probably dedicate an entire service to them. So it's enough to say today that God looks back at that story and he doesn't even mention the lapse of faith or the lack of faith. Why? Because when he forgives sin, he forgets sin. He remembers it no more. So you read the story and we all have it. We know what really happened and God says, yeah, but you know what? Now that he's forgiven, now that I've forgotten, we're not going to bring that up again. That should bring some comfort to you if you're walking by faith, but you remember when you weren't, when you're doing what's right, but you recall when you weren't. He also says, as we press on, verse 16, men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath is confirmation for them, uh, an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. The word oath here is a legal term. We're familiar with it because even to this day when someone goes to court they haven't placed their hand on the Bible and then we're told well you're to swear that you'll tell the truth the whole truth, and we all know. But you know, that's not the end of the statement, is it? So help me God. We are acknowledging that we're going to tell the truth. We are swearing by the one who told us, better not to swear, just let your yes be yes and your no be no, but that's another study for another time. But we're swearing by him and we're relying on him. So help me God. Enable me to tell the truth. Picture yourself testifying against the mafia. And you need to tell the truth. But you're pretty sure that even, you know, they're going to give you a new identity and they're going to hide you somewhere. These guys are known to find you. I I'm not sure that will ever happen. I hope that never happens to any of us. But the point is, so help me God. It's saying, God, help me to tell the truth. Nothing but the truth. Listen, he swore and he made an oath. And again, we'll see this played out in future chapters. Finally, he says, by these two immutable things in which it's impossible, verse 18, for God to lie. No, it's impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled to refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Listen, we have the hope of perfection. We have the hope of heaven. We have the strong consolation, but there's something else and fled to refuge in the old testament when the children of israel entered into the land of promise there were three cities of refuge on one side of the jordan three cities of refuge on the other i mentioned that the capital crime of murder there was no forgiveness in the law but manslaughter there was provision if you accidentally killed someone so the avengers of the blood which would have been the relatives, couldn't do you in or take you out, well, you could flee to city of refuge. You would live there protected until the death of the high priest when you were allowed to return home and they were not allowed to exact revenge upon you. All of that for them, an illustration for us. We have fled to Jesus. He is our city of refuge. Our hope, it's him. Our security, it's him. His promise, his oath, his cross, his blood, his work. This hope we read, we have as an anchor of the soul. It's almost a strange illustration because, you know, ordinarily an anchor would keep you in place. 
This is saying as citizens of heaven, what we have, we have ourselves anchored to him in heaven. It's not like we're setting down our roots here or throwing our anchor out here. We're tethered to him. We're anchored to him. We're connected. Ephesians says, seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We have an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. We've touched on it. Jesus ministered in the courts of the temple. He never entered the holy place because that was the Levites. He never entered the holy of holies because that was Aaron's descendants. But here's the deal. He came from the actual throne of the father. He came not to the model, but to the reality, not to the symbol or the shadow, but the substance. He was there. He came down, became one of us, lived among us, died for us. We have this anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. We're told to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. He is our mercy seat. He shed his blood for our sins. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Lord.